there's so much rampant change going on in the world uh, that the level of uncertainty is at unprecedented highs. It is growing exponentially harder to get an accurate view of what even the next two or three years is going to look like. But what I'm here to talk to you about today is it's not enough to just get better at spotting and reacting to disruptive change. But how do you actually be the disruptive change? How do you commit to leading the disruptive change? And that is a completely different proposition. Now the way to do that is really starts with asking three key questions. The first is, what do you want to disrupt? Now this sounds obvious, but most people look at the wrong thing when they're asking this question. We're all so obsessed in management with trying to find the big problems that need to be solved. You often hear the expression, hear the expression pain point come up a lot. What are the pain points that we need to solve, either internally in the organization or pain points for our customers? But the problem is when you're just focused on trying to spot the big problems that need to be solved, you're actually blinded to everything else and you miss a lot of the nuance and the context which, which can reveal very promising opportunities for innovation. In fact, we often say the richest areas for disruptive innovation are the areas where nothing appears to be broken. I'll give you a quick example of that. I used to work with a guy at uh, Frog Design, a global consultancy for innovation called Jonah Store. And Jonah was out to dinner one night with friends doing what wannabe entrepreneurs do. Sitting around, trying to talk about disruptive ideas for tackling lazy industries. They got onto clothing, they started going through different articles of clothing, and got onto socks. And somebody said, you know, wouldn't it be crazy if somebody started selling socks in sets of three? Now everyone at the table thought this was the most ridiculous idea they'd ever heard. Why? Because we've only got two feet. Everyone except Jonah Store, he couldn't get the idea of selling socks in sets of three out of his head. He felt like it was a category that was ripe for disruption. So he left Frog Design to start a new company called Little Mismatched. And that's what they do. They sell socks in sets of three. And Jonah thought, well, while we're at it, we might as well break another assumption is that your socks have to match. So he sells them in sets of three and none of them match. Now, he had to obviously find out who would find value in socks that don't match. And what he found out was eight to 12 year old girls love socks that don't match. In fact, they love a lot of things that don't match. So now they're selling mismatching pajamas, mismatching furniture and everything else. So the best areas to look for your business are areas of the business where nothing actually appears to be wrong. And you start at a very high level, a 30,000 foot view and it's simply by posing this question. How will we disrupt the competitive landscape of, insert your situation, by delivering an unexpected solution? And that should set the focus for the disruption activities to follow. Once you've found something to focus on, the second thing is to start with the orthodoxies in play. We often call these cliches, okay? So what are, the assumptions, you know, the widespread beliefs that seem to govern the way everybody is thinking about and doing business in this particular space. And many of the assumptions that govern today's business models in every industry, many of those assumptions were made on decisions which were driven by a different age and a different context. And the reason they still exist is that just nobody has bothered to challenge their ongoing validity. And that's what this is about. Surfacing the cliches involved in your situation so you can get them out on the table where you can deliberately challenge them head on. Now the third question is, what are your disruptive hypotheses? Meaning what are the big, bold, provocative questions that you haven't asked yourself before your team hasn't asked themselves before. In fact, nobody in the business has asked before. Now, the roadblock here is most people dismiss anything that seems to resemble a provocative question straight away because it doesn't track 
with their experience. And it sounds absurd. It doesn't seem practical or realistic. And this is the major difference between a disruptive hypothesis and a regular hypothesis. With a regular hypothesis, we're making a reasonable prediction that we can then test. Okay, so we're coming up with something that seems like, yeah, that's a reasonable idea. I can see that working in the business. With a disruptive hypothesis, the point is actually to make yourself wrong at the start in order to be right at the end. Meaning you have to make yourself wrong in order to get yourself into a position where you can actually see the right solution at the end. So once you have these cliches, all these things that people are taking for granted, your job now is to rearrange the pieces. Because you're trying to look for a different arrangement of information that's going to provoke a new way of looking at the situation, both for you, for your team members, and other leaders of the business. Because that's what disruptive hypotheses do. They're about forcing provocation. Provocation that is going to promote strategic introspection for the business. So they're the three questions. What do you want to disrupt? What are the cliches involved? And what are your disruptive hypotheses? Once you have those provocative questions, you can then go about answering them with as many creative ideas that you can generate or find in industries different from your own that you might be able to apply to your situation.